I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies at UC Berkeley. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center, and we're very proud to be hosting this event tonight, Child Migrants, A Journey of Desperation and Hope. The United States has really had two souls to its immigration policy right from the beginning. One soul has made this country the most welcoming in the world to newcomers. The other soul has sought to circle the wagons and exclude. While there have been two souls, our ideals as a nation flow from the first soul Emma, Emma Lazarus' famous lines on the Statue of Liberty have welcomed millions and really still inspire. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. As a nation, we don't look back with pride on moments of, exclu of, of exclusion deporting tens of thousands of Mexican families during the Great Depression, mm -hmm. or turning away the St. Louis, the last boat of Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany, after its passengers saw the lights of Miami, the ship was sent back to Europe in 1939. Since last October, 66,000 unaccompanied children, mostly from Central America, have sought refuge in the United States. While they represent only a small percent of all immigrants, these kids have sparked a sharp national reaction. Governor Perry of Texas has deployed 1,000 National Guard to the U.S. Mexico border at a reported cost of $18 million a month. Some communities, as we know, in Arizona, New Mexico, and even California have staged angry demonstrations against even providing temporary shelter to those who are fleeing. Overall, California has taken a different course. The governor, the attorney general, the state legislature have sought to reach out to these children to ensure rights are respected and that the children are well treated. Communities across the, the state have done the same, as have many NGOs and religious organizations. The California Catholic Conference of Bishops stated the gravity of this situation transcends politics. It is truly a humanitarian crisis that calls all of us to respond with compassion and with urgent action. Unfortunately, much of the national debate has not transcended politics. It has been defined far too narrowly. How do we send these children back as rapidly as possible and ensure no more arrive. Two far more critical issues have been lost in this narrow focus. Why are these children fleeing their homes in the first place? And what needs to be done to address their plight immediately as well as to address the plight in the longer term? These critical questions are at the core of what we'll be discussing this evening. We have, we're extremely pleased to have with us uh, three highly regarded scholars who have spent decades not simply doing very fine scholarship, but engaged in this region. And we are particularly pleased to have with us a key legislator from Sacramento who has been a strong and effective leader on immigration issues. Let me briefly describe our format and then introduce our first speaker. We've asked our speakers to give brief 
opening remarks, just to put an idea or two on the table. We then will follow this with a discussion among the panelists. And then we'll open the conversation uh, to questions from people here and questions that we've received online. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Professor Beatrice Mons of Geography and Comparative Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. And I should point out that for all our speakers, we could fill the entire time just with their introduction. So we're going to start by keeping that brief. Uh, she has done extensive work on Guatemala. She's a cultural anthropologist. In, in 2013, she, specif she testified as one of two expert witnesses in the trial that convicted former dictator Efrain Rios Montt in Guatemala on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. Professor Beatriz Mons. Thank you. I know that I'm supposed to be brief, and that is very difficult. Uh, let me begin by looking at some uh, inescapable facts. We are geographically, as well as, of course, economically, historically, and culturally linked to Central America. We can't escape that fact. Another contextual fact related to Central American migrations is that the United States intervened in Central America during the Cold War providing billions of dollars and military training while paying little attention to the devastation and horrific human rights abuses, as well as the massive population displacement during this conflict. In effect, during that period, and what we have today, we're seeing today, is a lost generation, sadly so. An, incon an inconvenient, as inconvenient as it may seem now, the United States cannot just pretend it has nothing to do with Central America and avoid some responsibility. As Colin Powell famously said about consequences of American interventions, quote, if you break it, you own it. <laughs> That's Colin Powell, the, what was his role? A defense secretary, right, and secretary of state from the United States, uh, and a general. Uh, and of course, after the mayhem that resulted from that Cold War, the United States government simply lost interest in the region. Now let's move to the present. There is a humanitarian emergency, not a crisis at the border. And certainly it shouldn't be a crisis for a country like the United States of America. As Oscar Arias said, the former president of Costa Rica and uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, quote, what can the United States do to these children that would be worse than what they have already suffered? And why is such a great country even asking such a question? A few facts again. The US is the largest drug market in the world, with consequences, of course, for Central America. The US deported about 50,000 Central Americans with criminal records, many of them gang members, without regard to the local consequences and whether these countries had the ability or the willingness to deal with these deportees. In Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the response was simple, mano dura. There were no government programs to find a long-term solution and integrate this population into society. So what is Washington's response to the influx of young people to the United States today? This is being described as a huge political issue in an enormous country. Is this a common response around the world when confronted with massive refugee population? Let's look at Mexico. In 1939, Lázaro Cárdenas encouraged and welcomed more than 30,000 refugees from the Spanish Civil War. In the 1980s, it had over 100,000 refugees from Guatemala, and of course, also exiles from Chile and Argentina. In the 1980s, over 60,000 Salvadorans sought refuge in Honduras, and over 20,000 went to Nicaragua. Right now, today, in Lebanon, a country of 5.8 million people only has over 1 million refugees from the Syrian 
conflict. That, I think, we may want to call a crisis, but not what's happening at the border here. The world today has over 10 million refugees. But in the United States, these thousands of kids are viewed as a huge problem. It is so exaggerated, one gets the impression that the United States of America can't handle it, and it may need the UN to come in and give us a hand. <laughs> Finally, I want to underscore once again that the US is not an innocent bystander in this situation. The US must protect these children and follow national and international laws uh, pertaining to refugees. And it must responsibly respond to conditions in Central America, given that background and that uh, connection to Central America that I spoke about. Only when families see a future for themselves and their children in their home countries will migrations north subside. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker will be Rosemary Joyce, uh, who's a professor of anthropology here at Berkeley, a highly regarded uh, archaeologist, and the interim dean of the graduate division at UC Berkeley. She has participated in field research and worked extensively on Honduras since 1977. Rosemary Joyce. I think Beatrice has given us a beginning point for the entire region. What I want to talk about is the Honduran case. Um, and my beginning point here is to address two questions. The first one is, why are children coming in such large numbers from Honduras to the US? And the second one is, um, what are the kinds of, of moves or actions that might change the conditions that are causing that very dangerous journey to be more attractive for these children than staying in the country. And a couple of numbers, I, I think we're all overwhelmed by the numbers, but I, I do want to mention that um, the Honduran, uh, the number of Honduran unaccompanied children that entered the U.S. on the southern border be between 2013 well, last year and this year, it's fiscal years, federal fiscal years, so they run from October to September, went up dramatically, almost doubled from fiscal year 2011, which ended in September of 2012, from 29,000 to, in the most recently completed fiscal year, 48,000. So just on the numbers, we're looking at an astronomical increase. But it's not just the num sheer numbers, the proportion of unaccompanied children entering the US in the southern border that came from Honduras went up in a percentage wise from uh, about four and a half percent of the population before 2012 to seven and a half percent since 2012. These are all US government numbers. So what we're seeing is across the region certainly more and more children, unaccompanied children entering the country as well as children traveling with adults. And the numbers have increased in both of these places, but the proportion coming from Honduras and the absolute numbers coming from Honduras are extraordinary. And if you read any news coverage, you know what the simple answer is that's being packaged. Honduras is a violent country. Well, my friends in Honduras want me to say Honduras is not a violent country. Violence in Honduras is um, specifically impacting people in certain places and that violence is not because of some innate violent characteristics of Honduras, but is a fairly direct result of the 2009 coup in Honduras and the lack of civil um, structures that survived after the coup and after the government that followed. When you have a country where the police are not, in fact, the people who will enforce the laws and protect you, but are the people who will um, murder you, even if you're the son of the rector of the National University, and extort from you, then your trust in there being any kind of civil society to help you goes away. Um, moreover, those members of the police and security forces who uh, undertake these kinds of activities um, benefit from virtual Im impunity 
in a country where militarization, the kind of militarization we saw in Ferguson, has thoroughly pervaded the populace. The army now polices the streets of San Pedro Sula, where I used to live and work. The army now polices the streets of Tegucigalpa. And prior to 2009, that was against the Constitution. So again, with Beatrice, I would say we actually have to look at some more complex histories of relationships between the US and uh, Central America in order to account for what is going on. And that should then cause us a little bit of uh, a pause before we solve the problem in the way the US has actually proposed, which is by sending more military and security aid. And in the last minute and a half that I have, I want to give you the numbers from the presidential fact sheet. Um, regional rule of law funding, $65 million. Regional law enforcement and security funding, $96 million, all being addressed to try and change the flood of children coming up. Um, direct security and governance, $161.5 million. And this is for the region as a whole versus $130 million for non-security, what we would normally think of as general developmental aid. If you add those numbers up, it's very clear that the US is funding an exaggerated security force buildup. And the reason is because of the drug trade. The US has uh, established these kinds of policies and funding priorities in a vain attempt to stem the flood of cocaine, even though, in fact, the amount of cocaine coming into the US has apparently gone down, um, and even though reputable um, social science studies have shown that when you put this kind of investment in to try and interdict uh, drug trafficking, what you do is you increase the violence between those who remain behind and are competing with each other to control what remains of the lucrative trade. Um, for Honduras specifically, then, I want to return to violence. Violence exists. Violence is a problem in Honduras, but it's a specific problem, and it's a problem that actually maps very precisely, as a number of news media have shown, and as the UN High Commission on Refugees has shown, to the origins of the children who have come in this most recent peak. The children are not coming from random places. They are coming from Tegucigalpa and San Pedro Sula, El Progreso, and other cities in the north and west of the country that are actually now largely controlled politically by the, uh, the drug cartels in the region. And I'm happy to talk more about any of these themes in the remaining part of the discussion. Our next speaker will be Karen Musalo who's a professor of law and director of the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies at UC Hastings. Uh, she has contributed to evolving jurisprudence of asylum law through her scholarship as well as her litigation of landmark cases. Uh, she has received numerous advocacy awards for her pioneering legal work, including the 2010 California Lawyer of the Year Award. Uh, but I can't really introduce Karen Masalo right now without mentioning that in the last week or so, she played a significant role in a critical case where a court decided that those who were victims of domestic abuse would be eligible for refugee status and asylum. Karen Masala. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be a part of this discussion, this very important discussion today. And thank you for such a generous introduction. Um, as you've heard, the numbers of children have been increasing. And I agree that it is not a crisis, given the, the size of the United States and the resources. But there's no denying that since 2012, before 2012, the numbers of unaccompanied children arriving were between um, 6,000 and 8,000 a year. And they began to double in 2012, going up to over 13,000, 2013, 24,000. Um, this year already, as you heard, 66,000. Um, so the numbers are, are going up, which really causes us to ask some questions about why, and also to ask some questions about what should be the appropriate response. 
Um, there have been politicians who have been, you know, trying to make hay out of this. And their response as to the why is that we're too nice to the kids. We're too <laughs> lenient. We should really get tough. And there were, you know, what they were talking about was a law that was passed in 2008 with bipartisan support during the administration of President Bush. It was called the Torture Victim Protection Reauthorization Act, the TVPRA, which actually said, let's give kids a little bit more process than we give adults. And I don't want to bore you with the technicalities, but, but let me just sort of explain one little thing about this. In the US, before 1996, anybody who reached our shores could ask for asylum and have their cases decided. In 1996, which was a very big wave of anti-immigrant sentiment, we passed a law that had a provision that made it a lot harder to access our asylum system. Everybody who arrived had to pass a screening mechanism before they would be even permitted to apply for asylum. That's called expedited removal. And that's been in place since the beginning of 1997, enacted in 1996, into effect in 1997. And what the Torture Victim Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008 said is, gee, let's give the kids a little bit more process. Let's not make them have to prove their case immediately upon arriving, but let's actually give them some time to adjust and to actually pursue the claim. So this is like our too lenient on kids, is that we're not putting them in regular detention facilities, we're actually putting them in more appropriate shelters, <clears throat> we're trying to re reunite them with family, and we're trying to give them a little breathing space before we ask them to talk about why they came. So this is what the pol some of the anti-immigrant politicians seized upon, is let's take that away and let's treat them the way we treat the adults, and just, you know, as quickly as possible, lock them up and deport them. And unfortunately, um, at first, President Obama and his administration's response was to actually adopt that narrative, that we're too nice, and to actually call for Congress to amend the Torture Victim Protection Reauthorization Act, which was very disappointing to those of us about this issue, we expected more. Um, when Congress, Congress has not yet done that, but what the President has done um, administratively is actually many things that were quite restrictive. So the increase of detention, we now have detention of mothers with children on the border, we have detention centers in Artesia, New Mexico. Um, we have um, plans to build a very large detention center in Texas. And we are moving these kids through the system. You may have heard about the infamous rocket dockets, which refers to the fact that the Obama administration has given the, the, the directive that these kids are to be moved through the system as quickly as possible. And when you are moving kids through a system as quickly as possible, you don't have time for them to find lawyers. You don't have time for them to have sort of acclimate. And the, the, it, the entire community, and I really credit um, California and what the governor and the legislature and the attorney general have done to try to bring together those resources to support these kids, because what we are now seeing in San Francisco, and some of you know this, is 50 or 60 or more kids you know, appearing in immigration court scrambling to find lawyers, and the community is scrambling to respond. Okay, so my, my my, my first point is that the, the, um, the, the poli you know, politicizing this and scapegoating the kids and trying to use the arrival of the kids as a justification for taking away process is just wrong. It's not appealing to our better soul, right? It's appealing to the restrictive circle of the wagons. Um, but the second thing is, it's the wrong answer to the question. What, you know, I think this is what my co-panelists were saying. Why are these kids coming? They're not coming because we're so nice. I mean, it's nice if we could be nice, but that's not why they're, they're coming, right? They're coming because of levels, high levels of violence in all of the countries, the El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and Honduras, the levels of, of violence. Um, we, if we look at just the level homicide rates in these three countries are among the highest in the world. Um, Honduras actually has the highest homicide rate in the world. El Salvador is the fourth highest. Um, Guatemala is the fifth highest. This is homicide rates. If you look at issues about violence against women, which is a whole other subject that I work on quite a bit, um, and we have a phenomenon that's been referred to as femicide, which is gender-motivated killings of women, we have... Um, El Salvador actually having the highest femicide rate in the world. 
Think about that, absorb that. Guatemala with the third highest, Honduras with the seventh highest. And we're talking about a phenomenon that is underreported. So those numbers may not reflect the true, you know, the true dimensions of these levels of violence. Um, so a lot of the violence is the result of organized crime and gangs, but it's also all of the other factors of intervention of what the US has done in this region. And the gangs, you know, they're, they're, if, if I, had more than one minute, I, we could talk, you know, and this could be something we'll talk about more. But they are coming for this reason. <clears throat> and because they are coming for these forms of violence, many, if not all of them, would have legit, legitimate claims for protection as refugees. But the way in which the law is being interpreted and applied, I mean, one thing is just trying to rush them through the system so that they don't have lawyers and they don't have the opportunity. But the other really invidious fact is that our courts are interpreting the law in a way that really excludes them from protection for the most part. And one of the things I'll leave you with is a very sobering sort of tragic um, observation is that these kids that are being deported are, um, are in fact being killed. There was an, uh, an article um, that was in um, Huffington Post written by um, an LA Times reporter who, talk, who interviewed the director of the morgue in Honduras, who said that since February, there had been at least five or 10 children who showed up at the morgue who had been killed within a week of being deported from the United States. And so this is not the country that we want to be. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is not an academic, but a noted policymaker. Uh, v. Manuel Perez uh, is the majority leader of the California State Assembly, uh, and he is a representative uh, for the 56th Assembly District, which comprises Eastern Riverside and Imperial Counties. He has been a strong voice on a number of issues, particularly immigration. Uh, he's a member of the California Latino Legislative Caucus. During the 2013 legislative session, he served as its vice chair. He currently chairs the Latino Caucus Task Force on Immigration Reform. He was a key participant in the legislative delegation from the California legislature that went to Central America from July 14th uh, through July 23rd of this year. After that, he was also a key participant in a California delegation led by Governor Brown to Mexico and Mexico City. V. Manuel Perez. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you, and especially with the students that attend here at Cal. I appreciate you being here. The professors as well, and staff. Uh, Dr. Shaken, thank you for the invitation. Uh, Dr. Beatriz Meraz, muchas gracias. Rosemary Joyce, Karen Musalo, thank you for your great work. And as well, I have staff here that are with me. Uh, my chief of staff, Jose Carmona, is here as well. Rafael Aguilera is here as well. And my son, uh, Ruben Perez, <laughs> is here as well. <laughs> so well, I guess what I'm going to try to do is connect the dots, right, from what you've heard already from our scholars and what was mentioned and my experiences uh, while being in Central America uh, and in Mexico. Uh, and let me just first off start by saying I agree that it perhaps isn't a humanitarian crisis, uh, but a humanitarian emergency. But at the same time, it's also a man-made catastrophe. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that, in my opinion, it is our responsibility, uh, our moral obligation as fellow human beings, as Californians, uh, to do everything we can to assist our brother and our sister. Uh, 
uh, no matter what it may be, if it's the issue of immigration or, or a soldier, for example, that's homeless, or, uh, or a single mother uh, that perhaps is looking for work, uh, that needs some assistance, I think it's important that we do everything we can to aid our fellow brother and our sister. At the same time, though, I think we need to recognize that this catastrophe, uh, this man-made catastrophe, it is directly related, in my opinion, to U.S. intervention. Uh, what we are seeing, the high levels of poverty and, unfortunately, homelessness in Central America and the lack of jobs and the fact that there are youth that are not going to school because of lack of public education, so on and so forth, those are all symptoms uh, of why, uh, those are all symptoms as to how it relates why the United States intervened way back when it did, whether it was in Honduras or whether it was in El Salvador. Uh, I think we need to fess up to that. And I think we need to fess up to the fact that in those years, especially in El Salvador during the Civil War, 19, I think 1980s to 1990, uh, 10 years of Civil War, the United States government pumped in billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, to ensure that the left would not gain power, all based on uh, the importance of United States capitalism and business here and ensuring a profit. <coughs> so I think we need to recognize that point uh, for what it is. And with that being said, uh, because of the struggles that people are facing uh, in Central America, I don't see uh, those unaccompanied youth and their mothers as immigrants. I recognize them as refugees, right? And so uh, that being said, it is important that we do everything we can uh, to ensure that the United States government and California uh, do a better job of not only understanding why we are in this situation, but at the same time providing the resources so that those governments can uh, do everything they can to ensure opportunity uh, for their people. Uh, that's one point that I want to make. Uh, another point uh, that I'd like to make is the fact that there was some reference to the cartels and to the gangs. I'll tell you, uh, those gangs are getting very sophisticated. And one thing that I learned while in El Salvador uh, and as well in Guatemala, I did not have uh, the pleasure of going to Honduras, but I was in Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, and Mexico. Uh, those drug cartels and those gangs are using social media uh, to reach out uh, to families and to reach out uh, to the youth. And as they're using social media, uh, they're <coughs> lying to people. Uh, they're saying that for $5,000 to up to $10,000, uh, we will take your child uh, and help them cross the border. And we will ensure that they cross the border and we will ensure uh, their safety. And once they're there, uh, once they cross the border, we will make sure uh, that uh, we find a relative or somewhere uh, where they can find a home or someone to take care of them. Uh, we know that uh, none of that is true. And so I wanted to raise that point as well. There was a, another point that was made around uh, political posturing, although it wasn't stated in that way. I call it political posturing for personal gain of politicos, in my opinion, that don't look at this as a humanitarian issue. Uh, and we do have them, whether here in California or in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think it's important uh, that we do everything we can uh, to ensure that these individuals that are here, our fellow brothers and sisters, do have due process under the law. And I'm very proud of the fact that California is at the forefront. Uh, we've been a leader on many different fronts, right, whether it's uh, the ACA and health care reform or climate change and global warming. Well, we ought to be the leaders once again when it comes to immigration. And we need to do everything we can to ensure uh, that finally one day at the federal level we will have comprehensive immigration reform. And here in California, I got one minute left, here in California I'm very proud of the fact that we did pass a budget trailer bill in which we will appropriate $3 million for legal services that will go to nonprofit organizations that will help serve these unaccompanied minors, as well as provide translation, translation services uh, to these individuals. 
Uh, and with that, I'd like to say that it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Questions? Questions? Mariana has some questions. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to have a, a brief discussion among the panelists, and we're going to take questions on cards for the beginning to get as many questions as we can, and if we have time, we'll go to an open mic. Uh, I just wanted to say something very briefly before we open it for our panelists uh, to make comments and discuss some of these issues. Uh, some, I think, very powerful things were said here. Uh, when Beatrice Mons quoted Colin Powell saying, if you break it, you own it. A simple concept, uh, Manuel Perez followed up on that by pointing in some depth to the role of U.S. policy and U.S. governments in creating an important dimension of what took place. Uh, Rosemary Joyce pointed out that Honduras is not a violent country, despite the high levels of violence, and I think that's a very powerful point to understand what exactly is going on there. Uh, Karen Masalo uh, by, asked the simple one-word question, why? Why have the refugees so dramatically increased, that is, the unaccompanied children or children and mothers or a single family member? And then by emphasizing that in El Salvador, uh, the country has the highest femicide rate in the world. Uh, and finally, uh, Manuel Perez, pointed out that we're really talking about refugees, not simply immigrants. And that here, going back to the very introduction, rather than transcending politics, we've wound up with political posturing, which makes it more difficult to address the core issues. So let me start by, by asking, does anyone on the panel have a comment or a question they'd like to ask? Uh, someone else on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, uh, maybe I, um, Manuel Perez uh, mentioned this briefly, but it's so much uh, in the news, the, or for a while it was, this was all about rumors. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone else wants to say something about the role of these supposed rumors that are, um, and that's the re or that because of President Obama and the rumors, or the rumors about President Obama, uh, that's why they're coming uh, to the United States. I, I think there's some truth to that. Now, when I mentioned the word rumors, I was, uh, I think I was linking that to the drug cartels or mm -hmm. the gangs that exist and how they're spreading rumors about the fact that once they get here, that they're going to be safe. Right. And obviously, that's not necessarily uh, the case. Uh, as far as our president is concerned and the lack of comprehensive immigration reform uh, and the fact that six years ago that was promised and we're still not there, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's, that's frustrating and, and very tough uh, for me to swallow. Uh, I think that we should have had, uh, in my opinion, a reform uh, that would have dealt with not only folks that are here already, but as well folks that are coming. And so uh, the rumors, uh, going back to that point, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's, it's a sad truth that's happening in Central America. Now, as well, there are monies that are being allocated uh, from the federal government that are now being used in Central America uh, for commercials. Uh, for ads and newspapers, right? Uh, letting families know uh, that uh, this journey to come to the United States uh, is one that could result ultimately in death, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and trying to do everything they can to dissuade people uh, from coming, right? 
But uh, I will say, though, at the same time, one of the key messages that I heard from the government from El Salvador, uh, and specifically from uh, the FMLN, the Farabunto Martí Liberación Nacional, which is a leftist organization that now has political power after so many years of suppression and oppression by the right government that was led, quite frankly, in my opinion as well, by the United States government, is that they are creating hope for their folks, right? And what they're doing now is doing everything they can uh, to ensure that youth can go to public education rather than four hours that they actually can spend up to seven or eight hours, right? Now they're implementing breakfast programs for their kids, right? Uh, now they're trying to do everything they can to ensure uh, that the farmers uh, can work their land uh, without uh, the exploits of agribusiness here from the United States. Uh, and so one of the messages that El Salvador, the FMLN, and the president, uh, Salvador Sanchez Seren, who was a guerrilla fighter, a comandante for the FMLN, uh, one of their messages is that they recognize uh, the issues that exist, but they also want us to recognize that that just didn't happen all of a sudden. And at the same time, they're going to do everything they can to provide uh, the social programs that they need uh, to ensure success and opportunities uh, for their people. If I can follow up on one, of, one thing um, here and add a little bit, um, the, I, I would actually characterize the use of social media not so much even as rumors. Um, from a Honduran context, if uh, someone who's part of a drug cartel promises you that they're going to deliver on something, they deliver on it. Um, so in a situation in which the civil institutions don't deliver, they have a credibility the fact that they're lying to people mm -hmm. is a tragedy. Um, the other kind of rumors that have been given a lot of weight in the US media and especially by certain politicians who have a certain narrative um, is the idea that the upsurge happened because of DACA and that Central Americans don't understand DACA. Well, there's actually detailed month by month figures that were included in a Congressional Research Service report uh, put together in July, and they show that the increase actually happened before DACA. So you know, most, of the, most of the coverage gives it the fiscal year in which DACA happens is the year in which the numbers go up, but they actually start going up before that. So we can't actually use that, and especially the same numbers, the month-by-month -month numbers show that there's a, a sort of a, an upsurge in the first quarter in January of 2012, then there's another upsurge after January of 2013, and then this year, there's just been, it's a, it, you can't even call it an upsurge, it's just a total increase. Um, those are seasonal patterns, and one of the things that I'm trying to understand for Honduras is what things happened in those months. The thing that happened in the month of January this year was the inauguration of a new presidency, mm -hmm. and a presidency that may not be seen by the people of Honduras as offering the possibility of fixing what has been broken. Um, so I think rumors, when we, when, the other thing about the rumors thing that strikes me as being a very interesting trope in North America, it's as if people in Central America don't have any sources of real information. They also have access to information because many people have family members in the US. So they know um, how difficult the journey was. Many people who, tr who have made the journey have family members or themselves have tried more than once. Um, the coverage in Honduran media of the atrocities that have happened in Mexico when people who were traveling along were seized by cartels and used as slave labor until they were murdered has been extreme. So I can't imagine that people in Honduras generally think that this is going to be an easy trip or are operating under some sort of rosy scenario. I can imagine that they were hoping, and in this sense, perhaps Obama has some responsibility, hoping that under a president who has an international rep, uh, image as a more positive face of the US, that perhaps they were hoping to be treated more humanely. Can I 
Maybe if I could just add something here. You know, I think that, that in America, people often think that everybody wants to come to America. There's sort of this ethnocentric. And, and people really want to stay home, That's right. you know, the right to stay home. And people only leave when they're so desperate that remaining means losing their life, and leaving is at least a sliver of hope. And so there might be, like, there's rumors, and the rumor gives them hope, that they can save their life. That's not the reason they're coming, but maybe it gives them hope that that journey will get them to a better place. But I think that, that the talk sometimes, the way it's been used by, by some people, not here, but by some people, is to sort of obscure the fact that there are real root causes that force people to leave. That's the main thing, and then yes, there are people exploiting that desperation um, to make a lot of money. Yeah, I'd just like to add um, that rumors also occur in a context. And um, there must be certain conditions so that the rumors can be heard. And rumors also serve multiple purposes for people that maybe want these children and other people to just leave the country so they don't have to deal with the problem. Yeah. Let me put, ask another question that builds on some of the things that, that you've been talking about. Uh, is, there's no magic solutions here. We understand that in terms of the long-term possibilities in these countries. What might be a better path, one or two things, that provide some glimmer of making it more possible for people to remain in their home country? They have three months. Do you have um... um Well, first of all, uh, we need to deal humanely uh, with the children that are at the border. That's the first point. The second, I would say, in terms of the, 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 the countries themselves, um, especially in the case of Guatemala, but actually all three countries, uh, we need to um, have serious reforms in the legal system so that we don't have uh, the impunity and the corruption that we see, or the persecution in the case of the, you mentioned the, the trial, the genocide trial uh, that occurred last year, and the judges being harassed and fined and uh, persecuted, the same with the Attorney General. So unless something happens within the legal system, um, you know, the conditions are really not going to improve. Long term, of course, the United States uh, ought to have a responsibility to provide um, support to these countries. Um, we had no problem and nobody was complaining about billions of dollars being spent for war and destruction in Central America, um, five billion dollars to Little El Salvador alone. So I don't think we should be complaining about spending which normally would take a lot more. It's, it, it's a lot easier to destroy than to build. And I think the United States should step up and provide funding and support to uh, promote education, uh, training, uh, building schools, and a solid foundation so that these societies, as Karen said, would, people would rather stay in their country, but there has to be a future for them. Anyone else like to comment on this? I'd like to comment on that. Just to give you some, some statistics here, uh, earlier there was mention about femicide. Uh, it states here from the Observatory of Violence at the National University of Honduras uh, that at least one woman was murdered every 13 hours, 629 total femicides in 2013. Right? When we talk about uh, the LGBT community, at least 116 members of the LGBT community have been murdered since 2008. More than 30 journalists have been killed since the coup. Uh, at least 74 lawyers were murdered from 2009 uh, and 2012. And uh, since 2010, more than 100 activists uh, have been killed in the Aguan uh, Valley. Um, and so uh, obviously that's, that's very real and it's happening on an ongoing basis. Uh, I think that part of what we need to do, rather than providing uh, funding uh, for more enforcement, if you will, I think we need to form one of the requests as well that I received from 
the El Salvadorian uh, government was that to formulate a stronger partnership uh, with the federal government of the United States in which they look at each other as socios, as partners, to build upon the economy, to build upon international trade, uh, to ensure that through that process uh, they can provide jobs for folks. Uh, and, and so uh, in El Salvador, for example, I think the minimum wage equates to about uh, $1 an hour, right? Uh, the entire nation has a budget of, of $4 billion a year. And the United Nations recommends that developing nations spend at least 7.5% of their gross domestic product on education. El Salvador spends less than 3.5%. And so one of the things that I think we need to do as a nation is do everything we can to ensure that there is aid, uh, resources, but uh, in a way in which it's not based on, on oppression, not based on enforcement, not based on suppression, uh, but rather based on working as partners for uh, economic justice, uh, if you will, uh, in those countries. And one way we could do that. Now, I don't know if these monies have been released, but there was $277 million from the Millennium Fund uh, that was supposed to go to El Salvador. Uh, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, they were supposed to receive these monies, but then all of a sudden, the federal government mentioned that they needed to do something else, that the El Salvadorian government had to work on another measure. Uh, an anti-money uh, laundering bill, which they actually passed while our visit in El Salvador. Uh, and I don't know if we had anything to do with it, but they actually were able to pass it. The we had conversation with them after we went to the embassy and we had those discussions about the importance of this money, anti-money laundering bill being passed. Uh, when we had talked to the speaker of the FMLN uh, that day uh, before the bill was passed, he had mentioned to us that they had been in negotiations and, 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 and discussion with the right-wing party, the ARENA party, for, for weeks, for months, and he didn't see uh, any way that they were going to pass that bill anytime soon. We had that conversation with them one day. The very next day, the very next uh, morning, uh, they go into session and they actually pass the bill. But that was so that they met all the requirements so that they could receive the $277 million that would go towards transportation infrastructure that would go towards vocational education uh, for up to one million kids, right? Uh, that would go towards uh, loans for the, the, the farmers, right? I see that as a way in which how uh, we could be supportive and as to how uh, they can create opportunities for their people. Uh, I'd like to point out this is obviously and hopefully the beginning of a discussion, not the end of it, uh, because all these issues are critical. And, and as a public university, I think there is a particular responsibility to be able to pursue, think about, and engage these issues over time. Uh, before we go to the questions uh, that you've uh, given here, I just want to briefly recognize two people. Uh, the first, Sister Maureen from the East Bay Sanctuary, who has worked. <laughs> worked with immigrants in a very, very important way. And the second is a woman that we're very pleased to have with us this year uh, as a visiting scholar who is a very capable and unusually courageous Mexican journalist who has written extensively on the narco cartels and what is taking place in Mexico, Annabel Hernandez. <laughs> now, these are more or less your questions. Some of them are not a criticism, a little hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> or too long. <laughs> uh, Nicaragua is poor, yet little to none uh, are fleeing to the US like neighboring countries. What can we learn from that? Yes. So th this has been great to refute the fact that people are coming because of poverty. Mm -hmm. Nicaragua's levels of violence are so much lower than any of the Northern Triangle countries. And 
one of the things that people comment on, I see it as like a, a wonderful legacy of the Sandinistas, which is another place mm -hmm. where we intervene to make things so much worse, but that people really trusted the um, police force and there was a sense of community policing in Nicaragua. And so actually crime is, you, you don't have the levels of crime and violence in Nicaragua, whereas the other countries we're talking about, the police are so corrupt and so violent that you have to actually have your head examined if you report something to the police because they'll, you'll, you'll probably you know, be, suffer more for having reported it. So I think Nicaragua is a, is a great example of it's not just about you know, the poverty in these countries, it's about other conditions that, um, that really engender violence. Yeah, I, I like to add the, um I mean, oh, I completely agree with you that one of the differences with Nicaragua is the fact that there is a tradition of youth mobilization. They have mobilized politically. Uh, they have neighborhood uh, uh, committees. Uh, less, since most of the uh, people that left the country ended up in Miami and in Florida, less of that re returnee population that, that I mentioned. But I quoted Oscar Arias, uh, the former president of Costa Rica, um, what he said in an article that appeared in the Washington Post, the headline of that Washington Post op-ed was, Nicaraguans are not migrating to the US. They have their own American dream. Dos puntos. Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> and what does Costa Rica do, as he explains in this piece, is that they have a rather open policy. People come and go. The families can go visit. It's a much more humane and sensible policy. Instead, we really tighten the border so people end up staying here permanently because it's too, it's too difficult to have a circular migration. And the unintended consequences is that, of course, children want to join their parents. So it's a very different policy. We have a lot to learn from Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. That's an American dream for Nicaraguans. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, then here I'm going to uh, combine two questions. One is coming from here and one uh, off the internet. Uh, the question coming from here is, many people are claiming they don't want their tax dollars to go to immigrants who come here illegally. Uh, they don't want to recognize the children's horrible journey and dangerous conditions as a valid reason to receive aid. What can you say to these people? But before doing that, I would point out uh, that Rosemary Joyce and Beatrice Mons both wrote, I think, very thoughtful blogs uh, that are on the Berkeley homepage, one on Honduras, one on Guatemala in the, in the context of these child uh, refugees. Uh, and the response on the, uh, was overwhelmingly positive but not universally. So let me read one of the comments that relates to what I just read. Uh, I find it very difficult to have compassion for these children uh, uh, when American families are struggling with food, rent, medical, and the basics of life. The whole middle class has become the slaves of the world, working and supporting every country in the global picture. You want to give these people everything we struggle for every day of our lives. Uh, and then it goes on in that vein. It points out that the person who is writing this is 66 and has three jobs. Her husband works six days a week and her son uh, does not have a car yet has to get to work. How would you answer this line of reasoning? Um, this, this actually is probably one of the most common ways that many of my blog posts get contested. And um, I think the problem we have is very clearly that people have been convinced that it is a zero-sum game where the U.S., with the amount of wealth we have, can't afford to support equitable life of its own citizens. And that brings us back to the problem of increasing inequality in this country. So you have the same forces that are um, promoting fears 
incredibly bizarre fears of Ebola outbreaks from children coming from Central America, are also promoting this idea that the very small percentage of the U.S. Uh, economy, uh, the U.S. government resources that would go to provide the legally mandated reviews for these children is somehow consequential. And basically the, the reply is we actually have the resources, we are not distributing them appropriately. Uh, any other comments on that? Well, the, the only thing I would say is that it's always easy, obviously, to uh, look at problems in the world from a very personal, uh, through a very personal lens. Um, I'm sympathetic to what this woman said, but uh, she's part of a country with a history. I would love to spend an hour with her to find out about her conditions, like you mentioned, um, and also to explain the um, situation in Central America and the role of the United States. I don't, she's 66, right? I don't, what was she saying when the United States was spending billions of her hard-earned tax dollars for destruction and war? She might have also cared, I don't know. But it would take a long time. I mean, that's what it would take to you know, sit down with her and talk about these issues. And maybe then she would still feel we shouldn't deal with these kids. We shouldn't have them here. We could point out how other countries deal with refugees. The human beings have been moving for hundreds of thousands of years or more. This is not new. This is a rich country. We are geographically linked. Where are they supposed to go? Can, can I just, <clears throat> I just want to add something. Not being an economist, I'm sort of treading into territory that isn't mine, but I know I have great economists to pull me out of it. But, but somehow there's this narrative in the U.S. that the problems in the middle class are because of the poor. Mm -hmm. in, and so, I mean, instead of yes. looking up yes. and sort of seeing, you know, all the tax breaks and all the money at the, so I think there needs to be an educational process too, because. You know, a woman who wrote that message, I can understand, and I really have empathy for her situation, but she's looking in the wrong direction to sort of argue for more equality and more compassion for somebody in her situation, right? And I think we, it's a process of educating people about tax policy. Sounds dry and everything, but I think if people really looked at why is it that they're not getting what a, what a, a decent democracy should give all of its citizens, it wouldn't be because we're giving too much below. It's because of what's happening above. If I may add as well. If I may add as well, you know, uh, policy is, is about balance. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get everything you want uh, in an idea or an issue. Uh, but I do agree that it is our responsibility as policymakers to do everything we can to support her, to create opportunities for her as well, to create access, uh, to make it a, li a little bit more uh, even of a playing field. Uh, but it's, it's also important that we do take a look at tax policy. We do take a look at the subsidies that we provide corporations, right, and how much we actually put into the prison system, for example, against the education system, for example. I mean, those things are very real. Now, I live uh, and I represent an area that is a border region. Right? I, I live in, uh, in Coachella, California. Right? Uh, I represent Imperial County and East Riverside County. And, and uh, the area that you saw, uh, protesters, uh, Marietta is just down the street from my district. It's not necessarily my district. But uh, that anger that you saw and that hate that you saw uh, obviously uh, had an impact on all of us. Uh, as a result of that, those buses ended up uh, taking the youth and their mothers to El Centro, California, uh, which is right down the street from Mexicali, right, uh, Mexico. And I had the opportunity to go visit that detention center and go visit the families and have a conversation with them and at least find out if uh, they're receiving health care and if they're actually eating okay, eating well, and just find out how the detention centers look and if they're uh, at least housed in a way um, in which um, uh, they're being nurtured or at least they have some access uh, to relatives or as well uh, to individuals that can provide them uh, resources uh, later as they're going through the process. Uh, 
Um, and so one thing I want to say, though, is that although there was a lot of hate in Marietta, and I'm sure there's good people there, too. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, I give a lot of credit uh, to uh, the nonprofit organizations, uh, the churches, right, uh, individuals that came together, and folks from law enforcement as well, and even folks from the Border Patrol, uh, quite frankly, that came together and worked in unison to provide a helping hand to those individuals and ensured everything they could to uh, make sure that they had access to health care, uh, food, uh, diapers for their babies. I met a young woman who was 16 years old who had a, a two-month-old baby, right? Uh, I met a 19-year-old uh, young lady that had a two-year-old uh, daughter as well, right? Uh, and so uh, what I saw was there, there was a process, though, that made sure that eventually they were able to identify their sponsors, meaning a relative somewhere in the U.S., uh, and uh, there was a process in which within a few days uh, they would identify these folks, they would provide money for a plane ticket, uh, or they would drive down and pick them up. And so that's one piece that I just wanted to mention, but just one last piece as well. Look, the agricultural economy is based on folks that are undocumented, right? 90%, between 80 to 90% of folks that are picking grapes, right? that are out there uh, uh, working in the fields on our behalf are undocumented folks, right? Uh, half the people, between 40 to 60% of the individuals in the service sector, those individuals that mow our lawns, that cook our meals, right? Uh, that take care of our elderly or take care of our kids while we go to work, uh, between 40 to 60% of those individuals are undocumented. And so uh, we have to be very real with ourselves as to how uh, we as a nation uh, how our economy is driven, and the fact of the matter is, without the immigrant, without the undocumented individual, uh, our economy here in the state of California, and perhaps in the nation, would not do as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a specific question for Karen Musalo. Uh, can you describe the legal process that child migrants go through when entering the U.S.? Is it different for adults? Well, that is what the torture vic the TVPRA created. So an adult who arrives at the US without documentation has to go through a screening process in which they have to show that they have a legitimate enough or strong enough asylum case to be actually permitted to apply for asylum. And there are now a lot of people at the border who are not being permitted, adults that are not being permitted to apply for asylum because in that screening process they're being screened out. That's what the TVPRA did for children who are not from Mexico. There's a different, this is one of those again um, unfortunate things, the Mexican children do have to go through a screening process, but the Central American children don't. So they are actually permitted, even if they're held in detention, um, they are permitted to pursue a claim. So if they are fortunate enough to, to secure legal counsel, they can then be interviewed to see if they would be eligible for the, for the three or four different forms of relief that unaccompanied children might be eligible for. So it's different from an adult in that they may at least get a chance to pursue a case, whereas the adult has this you know, hurdle to jump over before they're even permitted to apply. So there's two levels of screening for adults. One is your, um, your border patrol people who are supposed to ask some questions at the border. And you've, you have to imagine how somebody who's frightened, who's just arriving, who sees a person in uniform, who's asking them why they came, how likely it is. But if they say the right thing to that person, the border patrol person, they're supposed to be permitted in where they then have an interview with what's called an asylum officer who determines if they have a credible claim. So there's actually like two hoops to jump through if you get screened. First, the border patrol and then an asylum officer. And I, I, I just want to say one thing quickly, is that there was some rumbling, you know, months ago, even before the child um, surge, there was some rumbling by some anti-immigrant restrictionist types who were saying, too many people are getting through the screening process, you know, the percentages. And we saw it was really frightening and wrong and it shouldn't happen to rule of law. What did we see? All of a sudden, the numbers of people getting through the screening process dropped. So, hmm. right? So I leave it to you to draw your own assumptions, but I'm, you know, somewhat uh, uh, 
unlike, unwilling to believe that all of a sudden the claims were less valid and that's why the numbers dropped, right? There was a message being sent. Uh, unfortunately, we're about out of time. I'd like to do two things very quickly. First, I'd like to ask each person on the panel if there were one concluding thought they'd like to leave us with, what might that be? And then I have some very brief concluding remarks. Why don't we start with you, Manuel Pettis? It's been an honor for me to be a representative out of the 56th Assembly District uh, for my constituents as well as uh, for the state of California. Uh, my parents were both immigrants as well. Uh, my grandparents uh, had a dream that perhaps one day uh, their children or their grandchildren uh, would have an opportunity that they themselves did not have. Uh, my parents worked the fields most of the years. Um, my mother worked in the fields for 28 years before she finally left picking grapes. That's how they met, as a matter of fact, my mother and my father while picking grapes. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I'm here as a state legislator, the fact that my son is here, the fact that my chief of staff is here, and uh, my policy aide, Rafael Aguilera, is here, and perhaps many of you, uh, I think is a blessing. We should not forget where we're from, uh, but we also should uh, continue to do everything we can. Uh, it's our moral obligation, in my opinion, uh, to do what we can to support others when they're in need. And in this case as well, in my opinion, unaccompanied youth and their families and, and those that perhaps are just looking for an opportunity, uh, just like my parents, just like my grandparents. And that's my, my closing statement. I think, I think the, the most profound sort of observation or point to make is that this is really a moral issue. It's really an ethical issue. It's really an issue of conscience. How, how do we treat people who are fleeing for their lives? It really asks, you know, at a, at a very deep level, what kind of country do we want to be? And I, and I think the other thing to just add to that is that, you know, it seems so big and complicated to say we have to address the root causes. There are reasons why people flee and we have to address them. And sometimes people throw up their hands and say, you know, things are in such difficult conditions in each of these countries. But honestly, when you think about the size of these countries and the resources and the smart policy that would make a difference, it's not unsolvable. There just needs to be the political will and bringing people in to work as partners. You know, the, the, the way in which El Salvador, the government, members of government want to work in equal partnership with the U.S. So really reaching out in a respectful way to work with partners in each of these countries to be able to change things so that people have a chance to live lives of dignity and lives free of violence. Um, I, I think that the one thought I hope I'd leave with you is that violence has causes, and those causes don't begin in Central America, they begin in North America, um, and that we're not talking about inherently violent or primitive people who can't be brought into some sort of harmony. We're talking about situations where U.S. policy, current U.S. policy, is exacerbating um, specific forms of violence that are factors that are leading to people needing to leave, not just wanting to leave, but needing to leave where otherwise they'd prefer to stay. I'd just like um, to say that I would really like the uh, people in the United States to keep history in mind to keep the context in mind, and to honor Emma Lazarus and those wonderful words inscribed in the Statue of Liberty. It's hard to follow these very beautiful concluding remarks, uh, but I wanted to point out, I wanted to to cite what Karen Musalo just said, the moral, ethical issues, uh, how we treat people of conscience, 
uh, what all the people on the panel emphasized. Our values are very much part of this. They ought to be part of the discussion. The St. Louis, the boat, the last boat to leave Nazi Germany on the eve of World War II. After it was denied entry to Miami and to Cuba, it went back to Europe. Half the people on the boat died as a result of that. So the stakes are often high. Uh, the values uh, that are at issue are at issue for these children. I think in part why this has become such a, 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 an intense issue is it has transcended the children and become a flashpoint for other discontents, other concerns about immigration, mm -hmm. et cetera. But that makes it even more important to deal with this in an effective way that realizes our values uh, and addresses the concerns of these children and their families and the concerns and hopes of Central Americans. I wanted to recognize before we conclude uh, what Governor Brown and Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles did on the recent trip to Mexico that Representative Perez was a part of. They convened a meeting in Mexico City of bishops from throughout Mexico and bishops from Honduras, El Salvador, uh, and Guatemala. The notion was there may not be easy solutions, but there are better and far worse paths. We need to discuss this and shape this future together. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the people at the Center for Latin American Studies who put their heart and soul into organizing this event. Uh, and I want to very much thank our four panelists for this discussion. <laughs>